I get to introduce our moderator for the evening, who many of you know from a variety of different community actions and various nonprofits in the past, and he's currently the CEO of the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, Jeff Green. Good evening, folks. I usually would say, how are we all doing tonight? Um, I'm not going to ask you that tonight. I think I, think I have a broad sense. Uh, so I, I'm really happy to see all of these faces here. I, some of you may know that the, these series of conversations uh, co-organized by Urban Creeks Council and the Citizens Planning Association are not new. This has actually been going on for some time. Um, actually, before we go any further, I just want to call out uh, one person in particular who's really been the force behind those. That's Eddie Harris. <laughs> There's another Eddie Taylor in town. Hi, Eddie. Um, Eddie Harris has been uh, making sure that, that we convene around critical issues for a very long time. So I just want to thank him before we go any further. Uh, tonight, you have an opportunity. This, is some, this was actually going to be something quite different uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and of course, Mother Nature intervened, and here we are. Uh, I'll also tell you that our last uh, gathering, we had 19 people in the room. So, which is not a comment on the quality of these fora so much as simply um, nothing like what just happened to get us all together. So, what we're going to do tonight is we actually have sort of tossed out the old agenda and brought in a new, and that is we're going to hear from two of, of truly the preeminent experts, uh, scholars, folks that are just passionate uh, students of, the, of what just happened, uh, and we're going to hear from them. They'll have about an hour or so to share with us uh, just a really broad range of their knowledge of what they know uh, about the, the geology and the geomorphology and the hydrology of our region and why what we just witnessed on the 9th of January is actually something that is, is very much a part of the region in which we all live. And, uh, and we're going to try to understand that a bit better tonight. I do want to say uh, that tonight is really about the natural processes. It's about what just happened from a natural scientific perspective. Um, we are going to not go very far off that track tonight. We know there is much to do, and it will be months, and we know years of recovery and planning and thinking and responding. Uh, but tonight is something a little bit different. This is about what happened, why it happened, how it happened, what we know about all of these forces that came to pass, that came together, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to have a conversation from there. After we have our presentation, um, and actually I will say during the presentation, there are cards, index cards around the room. Um, because of the size of the crowd, we are asking folks to write down their questions, thoughts, that, issues that they want to have addressed, pass them to an edge. We have a few folks from CPA and Urban Creeks who are going to be wondering about collecting them. You can pass them forward. I will ultimately get them all in my possession uh, and try to organize them into the flow so that we can pass those to uh, our presenters tonight. Sound good? All right. Um, and I know, I know every seat is taken and there's standing room only and I, I will apologize in advance for that, but only kind of because I'm really happy you're all here. Uh, but as you see seats open up, we'll just kind of point to folks so people can, can make sure they get a chance to stay if at all possible. Um, so before we go any further, I want to introduce uh, someone from each of the two co-conveners and sponsors here. In addition to thanking our, our public library um, for hosting events like this, thank you so much uh, to Jen Lemberger and the library leadership. Um, first, I want to bring up Don Longstreet, who's going to say a few words on behalf of the Urban Creeks Council. Good evening, and thank you all for coming out to participate in this. My name is Don Longstreet, and I'm representing, as you said, the Santa Barbara Urban's Creeks Council. We're an organization that works for protection and preservation and restoration of streams and watersheds in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, one of our major goals is to provide information and to decision makers and to citizens as well, because we are a community, and that is how decisions are made. We want citizens, property owners, local government, flood control officials, building officials, the environmental community, and all stakeholders to benefit from the knowledge that's available. We've invited Professor Keller and Dr. Garola here tonight to educate us about the geological processes that shape our home. After tonight, I think we'll all have a better understanding about what has happened and what may happen. Our hope is that this information will allow us to make the best choices possible for the future. Our community has a huge task now to wisely rebuild and to prepare for the future. This disaster 
is an event we have all paid dearly for, and people have paid with their lives. We must learn from this. I grew up on the Hollywood Hills, where I learned very early on what happens when you put gravity and water together. Now I've lived in Santa Barbara for nearly 40 years, hiking, exploring, and working on the local trails. As a former member of the Santa Barbara City Fire Department, I have been chest deep in two 100-year floods in Mission Creek, one month apart. I've responded to the huge landslide in Sycamore Canyon, where we were within 10 feet and one rain cell of having our own Montecito. Now, I have a challenge tonight for our presenters and for our emergency response community as well. Ch changes in historic weather patterns and an increasing density on the coast, indeed in all of coastal California, I think require a new language. Clearly, there's a difference between a road covered with mud and a catastrophic geological event. New names and new terminologies will allow us to plan better, respond better, and for the layperson to understand the true nature of what may happen. I doubt that we have another 200 years to get it right. As author James McPhee was told 30 years ago, geology wins. Thank you very much for coming. Well said. Thank you, Don. Uh, I want to now uh, bring up uh, Lee Moldaver to say a few words about Citizens Planning Association, our other uh, co-convener and sponsor tonight. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Santa Barbara Public Library. Thank you, Urban Creeks Council. And especially, uh, thank you, fellow neighbors in Santa Barbara County for taking part of your evening to join us tonight. Across the street in the courthouse, which we've all been to dozens of times, there's the motto over the archway that, from the ancient Romans, God gave us the land, the skill of man hath built the town. That is the challenge that we're looking at tonight with Professor Keller, uh, last week with Ray Ford, and for weeks and months and years to come, as Jeff Green has indicated. Since 1960, Citizens Planning Association has worked in Santa Barbara County on the premise that our local residents, our neighbors, when given facts and given options, and given a minimum amount of uh, training can help effectively decide long-range community plans and goals for resource management, for levels of development, for infrastructure, for aesthetics. And that has gone through hiring consultants to create the first general plans for the city and county, uh, the agricultural element and the right to farm ordinance, working in the 1980s with people like uh, Bob Klausner, June Sockel, Michael Feeney, Jackie Campbell, to really create the highest standards of environmental protection for energy development on and offshore in the lower 48, under people like Louise Boucher and Mary Louise Days, trying to get the highest level of awareness, sensitivity, and protection for our cultural and historic and architectural treasures in Santa Barbara County. Our president, Betsy Kramer, is here tonight. Our executive director is on the right-hand side in the back of the room, Morell Brooks, a former planning commissioner from the third district. We would invite every one of you to sign up if you can, seek us out if you can. Now is the time for mourning and cleaning up and healing, but as Jeff Green indicated, the time for planning and policy for a safer, stronger, better community in the years ahead is gonna lay with everybody in this room and everyone in the community. And as soon as we start getting prepared, the more effective we will be. Thank you again. Thank you, Lee. Okay, so uh, 
Tonight, uh, like I said, I just want to remind, if you do have questions along the way, please jot them down, pass them to the edge, pass them forward. We're going to have some time afterwards to uh, dive into this uh, deeper. I do want to acknowledge that many of our elected leaders uh, are in the audience and some are in the overflow, uh, and so I want to thank them. I, I want to generally just acknowledge how many people, um, neighbors, friends, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, first responders, public servants of all types, uh, our elected leaders, just how much of our community came together in these last couple of weeks. And like I said, we're not going to spend our time tonight so much on the human side of it, but, but I think it's, it's appropriate and fair to acknowledge that everyone here, uh, you know, it's one or two degrees at most in our, in our community. So we all know someone who well, either lost someone or there was a severe injury or loss of property or they were displaced, some still are displaced. So we, we in the spirit of, of helping all of that um, and all of those uh, to heal, uh, we want to acknowledge that tonight. And, and in service of that, I think it is really important and a, a great time to spend some time talking about the underlying processes that led to what we all witnessed. Uh, because as Lee and others have said, many people when they hear the word mudslide, as Don said, what they picture is not what happened. And I think many of us, uh, myself included, really haven't gotten our heads around the magnitude of, of the, just the, the sheer volume of what moved and how much moved and where it moved uh, on the 9th of January. So we're gonna be here tonight to, to learn a bit more about that. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our two speakers. I'm gonna introduce them both and then I'm gonna get out of the way. The first speaker actually, he doesn't remember this because why would he, but I was a student of his 25 years ago. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and that is Dr. Ed Keller. Um, and, and actually, for street cred, Ed, it's true. I, I was a theater geology double major when I declared as a freshman. That is not a joke. Uh, the joke was that I could act like a rock, and that is true. So, uh, it's, tr it's true. It's on my record. I, I, things changed very quickly after that. Uh, I, Ed is, is an incredible teacher, uh, and of course that's why many of us know him, uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about his background before we bring up, him up. Uh, he actually uh, has over 20 years of experience in the public service side of this work as well, advising folks and consulting on this subject. Um, he has studied the development of stream channels and flood control. Uh, he likes big words like tectonic geomorphology and fluvial geomorphology, and I like them too. Uh, but he actually does something with those words, and he, he studies how land moves uh, and why it moves uh, and the forces of water. He's particularly looking at our Southern California chaparral zone and the, the interaction of, of wildfire uh, and the, the uh, subsequent flooding and flood maps that happen after that and the, the movement of debris. Uh, he actually got his PhD from Purdue. Uh, Indiana in geology in 1973, uh, promptly began his, his uh, career as a faculty member at the University of North Carolina that same year, but in 1976 he came here to University of California, Santa Barbara, and he has not left, and for that we're grateful. Uh, Dr. Larry Garola. Dr. Garola actually was also a student of Dr. Keller's way back when. Uh, he just gave a fist pump, so he's proud of that. Uh, he got his PhD from UCSB uh, in working with, with Ed Keller. Uh, he also uh, focused on uh, tectonic and landslide geomorphology when he was at San Diego State University and at UCSB when he was uh, being educated. Now he's an educator. Uh, and he has researched these same areas uh, quite extensively. He's presented to the USGS and many uh, geological associations and peer organizations. He's taught geology at UCSB, Pierce College, and East Los Angeles College as well. So we truly have, have two of the best folks that uh, we cost possibly could have here to share with us tonight. So I'm very happy to first bring up uh, Dr. Ed Keller. Ed. Well, thank you for uh, coming tonight. Uh, this event, people say, were you surprised? And I say, yeah, I was surprised. But it was something we sort of expected. It's like saying, you know, the San Andreas Fault moves every 300 years. You're surprised when it does, but we expect it eventually will. And so that's kind of the situation we uh, find ourselves in. Larry worked with me for a number of years on his PhD, uh, a lot of the time spent in Montecito. So after I finish, he'll uh, come up and say a few words to you guys about some of his mapping and so forth. I'd like to introduce uh, some members of my research team. Professor Kristen Morell is over here, and she's a new professor at UCSB, and I'm on sabbatical next quarter. She's heading up much of the research project, and is uh, so far is working very hard and getting some great steps moving forward. Professor Tom Dunn uh, advises us and may work with us as well. 
Uh, he's one of the leading experts in the world on debris flows. He's a real star in our field of fluvial geomorphology and those sorts of things. Uh, Dr. Larry Garreau, I'll introduce in a minute. Joan Florsham's not here. She's another one of my PhD students that worked with me studying the 1985 fire uh, in the Ventura area. Uh, Paula Lucio, Paul is over here. He's doing a PhD with me now on coastal erosion, but is moving into the area of the debris flow. And we'll be doing a lot of the technological work that is so important to get at the science, along with uh, Kristen. And I don't know if Erica's here tonight, but Erica go, go to is a, uh, one of my PhD students in geography. And she studies landslides in, ge in geography, but in Brazil. And she's going to help us with the social aspects of uh, this problem as we uh, kind of move forward. So that's kind of the research team. I got this one, two, three punch thing from a guy at uh, USC, and he was talking about, he said a one, two punch, but actually uh, when we see these events, the chaparral is somewhat different than lots of other environments. And so as a result, wildfire uh, plays a big role. And following uh, wildfire, uh, we uh, can get burst of precipitation and general flooding or debris flows in some cases. And so that's what we're kind of uh, working on. We have the, uh, the fire, the rain, and ultimately the uh, debris flow. But I will mention, as I'll show, talk about later, these really big events are, are relatively rare at any one place. Uh, I pointed at this or what? Okay, uh, okay. This is just Romero Canyon during the Thomas Fire, about 300,000 acres, a really big fire. Stretches all the way to Ventura, up into Ojai area, and all around. And so we're in one little corner of it where it kind of ended up. Uh, but uh, uh, these sorts of fires happen fairly frequently. Oops. This is a fire map of the United States of some of the recent fires. Uh, you can kind of see that most of them are in the western United States, right? Okay, we have a pretty big wildfire uh, hazard. It may be our biggest hazard we face other than the occasional big earthquakes uh, because uh, we've lost well over a thousand homes to these things in, in recent years. I've been evacuated three times uh, from where we haven't, we've lucky we haven't had serious damage, but we've been evacuated. We know with uh, climate change that wildfire intensity and size are increasing. That's not good news for us. Uh, but that's a, a factor with the warming earth. And the fire season's getting longer. Some people say it's almost all year now. And so that's something to think about. If fire and these floods and debris flows are linked, uh, then we'd like to see fewer fires, not more. OK, some of the interesting things will be uh, or some of the things Lisa will be discussing. Uh, people throw around the term mudslide. I've never really heard that term before I saw it so commonly in the paper. Uh, these things are flows, they're not slides, uh, but that's okay. You can cut, we all know what we're talking about. There are mud flows if most of the material is relatively uh, fine grain, like mud, okay, silt, clay kind of things can lead to uh, mud flows. And we had some mud flows during this event. Uh, particularly in the uh, front of the debris flow. Landslides, though, are another type of movement on slopes, and they can be deeper seated or shallow. And uh, often three to six feet or deeper. Lock and Cheetah is an example of a landslide, and the lower part turned as sort of an earth flow, but by and large, it's basically a, a landslide. And then debris flows are a moving mass filled with large material that may include boulders, tree trunks, and all sorts of things that can move fast, up to 20 to 30 miles an hour. So these aren't things you can outrun, okay? And uh, you'd have a hard time out driving them uh, when they happen, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. A minute. Okay, this is a busy slide, it's just to remind me to say some things, but basically, the debris flows generally start up in canyons from slope processes, and we're searching now for the sources. We think we have a lot of them identified, but there are probably many, many small sources that came together. Uh, 
And, uh, and then when they leave on, we call the Piedmont, but the lower land of Montecito, which by the way is a complex alluvial fan system. When I started this, I was talking about alluvial fans to people, and people said, a lot of people never heard of an alluvial fan. And uh, so uh, that's, imp or a debris flow. These are just mudslides, right? Which is okay, you can keep using that term. I don't, I don't mind it, we know what we're talking about. But um, the debris flow sources are on steep slopes above the foot of the mountain, which is called the Piedmont, which means it's foot of the mountain. Debris flow deposits, then they come on, the f on these debris flow fans. That's as adding more complex. It's alluvial fans, but we have a special type of fan we call debris flow fans. And Montecito is basically built on these, as Larry will talk about. Uh, they may be high speed and large volume. These are viscous flows. The viscosity is something like 200 times that of water. So you think of molasses as a really viscous fluid. This is a viscous fluid with uh, sand, fine sand, sand, silt, and clay. It's usually not too much clay, though. The unit weight of the mud, which we're calling this fine part, is about 120 pounds per cubic foot. The unit weight of the boulders is about 150. So they're pretty close. And that's one of the problems in why these boulders with the viscous fluid can, looks like these big boulders are just floating down the creek. So how can a 20-foot boulder float? Well, they're pretty close to the same density as the fluid. And so I tell people, it's an analogy, I think of ping pong balls on top just kind of going down. And they end up in the front of the flow and sometimes to the side. So the boulders are carried near the surface and the front and the side of the float, and they bob along. One of the problems, you know, I'm not going to mention too many infrastructure things, but anything that obstructs the flow can lead to problems. We don't expect these kind of events, and so when they hit bridges and things, big rocks get caught underneath them, and then the flow rises up and goes over the bridge, and then it can spread out. And uh, flood control told me that in some of the debris basins, the flow was maybe 10 to 20 feet higher than the, than the debris basin dam. So when you have these blockages, that can happen. Okay, so I talked about this, these stages then. This is an important one, the first one, the accumulation of debris in the canyon floor. And these are the large boulders. These boulders come from the sandstone up in the canyon, and over time they roll into, they get and end up in the bottom of the channel, and they reside there. It makes uh, cold springs and some of these creeks so charming as all these big boulders we love to hop along as we go up the uh, path. Uh, but they come down off the slopes, they kind of round a bit in the stream, and these are the boulders that end up, you know, way out in front of the mountain. And so uh, that's important. Then if we have a wildfire, well, wildfires are generally every 30 to 50 years, something like that. But over 50 years, the whole front, south front, is burned. There's been many, many fires. Uh, each one, some big, some small. You don't need a huge fire to get a big debris flow. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but the bigger the fire, the more potential basins that can have debris flows. Okay, so the intense precipitation, and I changed this just the night because I've been reading papers and talking to the USGS and the rain, half an inch in five minutes, that occurred. The US Geological Survey did a wonderful job of predicting where we were likely to have these events. And in one paper they wrote, they said that uh, the most diagnostic property was burst of rain that can be like a half an inch in five minutes, and we had a little more than that. And that, you can get them with different frequencies of this intensity. The total rainfall is just how many inches you had. The intensity is how fast it comes down. Well, one problem with this, obviously, is that, you know, you get this burst, and then the debris flow can come five minutes later. It's very short between often, which means that you can't start calling people and say, you know, you got three minutes or something. We have to be better prepared for that sort of thing in terms of where safe areas and where people can go. And we, we can talk a little bit about that, but we're really premature. So um, as a result, large debris flows that come out of any one 
canyon are relatively rare because this intensity is about a 200-year event on the average. So if I have a jar up here, a big jar and a full, of mum, full of marbles, each with a number on, and I say, Kristen, pull out a marble. And she pulls out when it's 10, OK? But she'd have to, if we have 200 marbles, she'd have to get the number 200 to get to this event. And then if she got it, we put it back in again. And then I say, pick another one. What's the chance of getting the 200 twice in a row? Happens, could happen. We could have 200-year floods, two 200-year intensities in the same year. But it seems unlikely. But it could happen, so we need to be prepared. Add that on the fact of the fires every 30 to 50 years, and you can understand why we think the likelihood uh, of any one basin ha this happening would happen is something on the order of hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand. So they're 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 really sort of rare events in that respect. But the more basins we have, the higher the probability that one of them will occur someplace. So anyway, that's part of the story. I did this graph actually a number of years ago. It's a little bit hard to understand, but I'll try to work you through it. We have random flood events. Floods are relatively random, like a bar of your jar of marbles, and you pull them out 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. And, but the watershed burns are relatively constant, 30 to 50 years. Occasionally, they line up, you see? And when they line up, you could get a debris flow if there's a threshold of basin instability. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the fact that the bottoms of these canyons are filled full of large boulders and ready to go. And if you get all three of those things together, you can get a debris flow. And so debris flows are relatively rare uh, for that reason. It's not often we line up all these things uh, together, and it makes a pretty high, uh, it's pretty improbable to do that, actually. And these other events we call FFF are, are sediment flushes that uh, there'll be a lot of fine sediment coming down. You may get flash flooding, and you'll get fine sediment come out. You may or may not get a mud flow, but you probably won't see the big debris flow unless there's enough. You have to have the boulders, right? So if we moved all the boulders out of these canyons, we probably won't see another one for a couple hundred years. Having said, or more, having said that, we don't know how many boulders are left up there yet. It's one of our tasks we're going to do. From initial work by Derek, who's sitting here, and Tom Dunn, uh, a lot of them are gone. And that's uh, good news. Uh, and, and for them to build back up to that level may take hundreds of years. So that's something to think about. Uh, this is just a picture of, uh, I think it's Cold Springs, that Tom Dunn took after the flow. You can see the flow got up here and cleaned everything out of the sides. Beforehand, it looked more like this, what we usually see, you know, in uh, Cold Springs and these mountain creeks, full of lots of beautiful boulders to climb around, and occasional really big boulders like this, maybe 15, 20 feet. People used to tell me in Montecito and other areas, in Santa Barbara, by the way, we have the same hazard, that uh, I really like these boulders in my yard. They're so beautiful. You matter what it costs to bring a boulder like that in? But they never seldom ask, where'd it come from? Why is it there? <laughs> and uh, we have answers for that. Uh, but again, they're, they're relatively uh, rare that you do this sort of thing. I have a picture of Tom up along one of the roads here. He's, he looks like an ant next to a 30-foot tall boulder sitting right on the road. And these things can move a long ways. Because why? Because they float almost. OK? And if they can float, they can just move with the flow 20, 30 miles an hour. So anyway. So right now, before the, the uh, debris flow, the channel looks something like this. Lots of boulders. There's still a few boulders here, but a lot less. And we need to know how many there are. Can we, can we generate this thing again? Uh, this is an interesting uh, graph because it's right at the Mission and Rocky Nook Park. Rocky Nook Park's right here. Little tiny area. Rattlesnake, I live right up here. This is rattlesnake landslide, about 1,000 years old. Came down, we think, blocked the canyon and led to a debris flow. The whole debris flow is this big, and it ran out all the way to past State Street, probably, 1,000 years ago. So next time you go to Rocky Nook Park, you can comment on the beauty of the boulders, and you should ask, how'd they get here? Now you know. It was a really big debris flow, maybe a million cubic meter, 10 million cubic meters. We have no idea how big the ones in Montecito were, but I don't think they were that big. They're probably quite a bit smaller. So anyway, this is the Rocky Nook debris flow. 
uh, that we've studied for years. And of course, at Rocky Nook, it looks something like this. These, these big boulders looking around like Easter eggs on the landscape. Hardly any lichen on them, so they're really young. We know that. They haven't been there long. And we have a date on this about 1,500 years to 1,000 years. And they come from a big alluvial fan again above Rattlesnake Creek uh, that's up on top, a lot of them anyway. And those, those boulders there dated 130,000 years. We've dated that using what's called cosmogenic dating, which is nothing magical about it. Cosmogenic rays are coming down all the time, and they infiltrate the rock at a known rate, and we measure how much there is, and the ratio is the age. So it's pretty straightforward, but it's a lot more work to get that date, okay? So it's not as easy as you think. But there's lots and lots of boulders there as part of, of this particular flow. If this flow occurred again, we would have a catastrophe much larger, I believe, than what happened in Montecito because it would cover a large part of that part of the city around the mission and all the way down to State Street and through that area. Many, many people live on this flow. Now, that looks a bit like this, doesn't it? Except we don't have a road in, Rock in, in Rocky Nook like this. But these big boulders along 192 just ended up on the road. And these are small ones. They were much bigger ones. Uh, so again, how they get there, now you know, right? You can say how they got there. They got there in this flow, and the flow came down, and they floated down with it, and the fine particles somehow got away from the rest of it, and they were left standing in one place. So, Some of these are so big, they have to blast them. This is a, and then you say, well, how common is this stuff? What goes on? I grew up right here, about eight years after this event. <laughs> 1934 in Montrose to La Crescenta, New Year's Day. Uh, there was a big debris flow from a relatively small fire that occurred a couple months before that. Came roaring down an alluvial fan in the Montrose, and uh, 40 people lost their lives. So we've seen these before. In 2003 or 4, there's another one coming off the San Bernardino Mountains, killed 16 people. We see these events, and we know they reoccur relatively commonly along all of Southern California. But this, nothing's come out of this in over 100 years, that canyon again. So we need to look at it kind of like canyon by canyon sort of view on these. And this is just some pictures uh, show this. It looks a lot like what we see in Montecito. The cars are a bit older, uh, but the same kind of look of the land. And people did, but back then they had no warning. They didn't, I mean, I don't even know how much they knew about the rain coming, much less what the uh, debris flow was coming or what to do. And so it led to a, a tragic event. So in our fire, it kind of moved to the west here in bits and spurts from December 10th to 17th. It stalled there for a while because the wind stopped. It wasn't wind driven at that point. And so I, I believe it burned pretty hard, but Paul will be working on that, on saturated hydraulic conductivity. Uh, because we think when it burns, the chaparral plants have waxy things in them, leaves and stems and things. And so when it burns, those waxy materials can infiltrate the top of the soil and almost make it like a piece of glass. After the Ventura fire, I went up. I didn't really know whether to believe this or not, but I'd read about it. And I talked to Wade Wells down at uh, San Dimas. And I went up there with a canteen and a bucket of water. I poured it on, whoosh, gone. Uh, but we don't know if the hydrophobic by sphere of water, hydrophobic soils are still present or not. They generally will break down after a few flows, but they can greatly increase the runoff by a factor of several times or more. So it's a, it's a big issue. And so we'll be going up there looking for hydrophobic soils. As during the fire, then the burning uh, uh, plants release gas that promotes the that uh, permeates the soil, and the roots may be weakened, but our chaparral regenerates. You may know that, it's fire adapted, so it regenerates. And so, uh, but it may take uh, a year or two, up to five years or a little longer. The US Geological Survey, which I mentioned is doing a great job, have estimated that probably the first year is the most hazardous, the second year is still hazardous, but up to five years, you can, you can expect maybe these types of things. And then, then you're talking about fire hazard again as it goes into 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and you develop more biomass and more fuel. So uh, this sort of thing happens. 
And it's really happening down in the soil with the cooling gases and, and so forth. The soil particles, a few inches below the surface, become plugged with this waxy debris. And also behind each of these little chaparral plants that burns, there's a little mound of gravel, sand, silt, or clay. And when it burns, then it releases that material in a process we call dry ravel. And if you go up there to the cozy dell where we think the source is, you can sit in the stream and hear it tinkle, 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 all down the, all down the slope. And these uh, ravel deposits can fill up the whole channel, given enough time, and they may be mobilized by water into, uh, into mud flows or debris flows. So this process we want to look at and just see what's happening up there. And uh, we put a little bucket on the ground. Paul can tell you about it maybe at some point. And we pour water in and see how much of it goes in. I expect a lot of it will just run off. And then we dig in a little bit and we do it again. If it's, and if we're below that level, then the water will just, you know, infiltrate. So that's a, one thing we can do. Oops. So the burned area above Montecito uh, looks like a moonscape, okay? Everything was pretty much burned. And, and in the hollows and other places, these hydrophobic soils are, where the fire lingers longer are more likely to be present. We don't know if they're still present, but we're going to look for them. I suspect there'll still be some. And so with a, with a heavy burn, we get a lot more runoff. And then, unfortunately, Montecito was the center of all the rainfall in this event. Okay, and we were warned in advance that a big storm was coming, but no one could have told you we get a five-minute burst with, with over a half an inch. It could have been down in Ventura. It could have been in Ojai. It could have been anywhere along this front, and they'd be suffering from these events probably, assuming there's enough debris in the basins again. So that, well, this is really bold, uh, you know, bullseye on Montecito. And, that five, and I was surprised to hear that it's a five-inch uh, pardon me, the half an hour, half an inch threshold is really important. But the U.S. Geological Survey did a big study of many debris flows, and that's what they found. It's a really big burst of rain, and they said that the debris flow can occur within five minutes after that, so essentially at the same time. So uh, we can't send out warnings that people say, you know, you got two minutes. Uh, if people aren't already gone or to a safe place, then it becomes a, a hazard. And so we need to pay attention to that. We really need to pay attention to the weather report, okay? And if you're living in an area of one of these streams, these things come down, uh, then you should think seriously about evacuating. And if you live between them, it gets a little, a little different, perhaps. Uh, Kristen's and Larry will be working on the fact that a lot of faulting runs through Montecito and these fans. And uh, normally, I don't like earthquakes. Okay, and I don't like faulting. It does produce some pretty topography like Mission Ridge. But in Montecito, the fans are younger and the, and the faulting has uplifted the land about, what, 20 feet, you said, Larry? 20 feet. So you can come down the mountain. And suddenly, because they're south side up, you get 20 feet of elevation. If you live there between the creeks, you're probably going to be okay. But that's unusual for fans to have that much faulting. And that's something, though, we'll be looking at. And Larry may talk about that. Okay, this is just some of the rainfall data from flood control I, that uh, Melinda Burns sent me. She uh, got it from them, and we'll look at this more. But this 0.54 inches in five minutes, probably greater than a 200-year event. Remember my bowl of marbles? Okay, 200 marbles in there, or 300. What's the chance of pulling out it, the one you, the 300? It's not much, but people do win the lottery, right? So. Uh, these, these kinds of odds that can come back to, to haunt us. The other return periods, I suspect this one hour, 1.5 hours, more than a five-year five uh, frequency. The 30-minute one may be more than 50. I'm not sure. That's something we're going to look into. But, uh, but these are pretty good rainfalls. Well, but this is five. It's just burst. I mean, a half an inch in five minutes, you might, it's probably more than your shower at home. In some respects, you know, if you have a low-flow shower. But uh, so... <laughs> This is just a little map of the area. You, you guys live in Montecito. We live around here. I don't know Montecito very well, I must admit. I go out there quite frequently when I work and stuff, but I get lost at night. I got lost three times trying to find Tom Dunn's house one time. But uh, Hot Springs Road, San Ysidro, Sheffield, and then the, the upstream uh, 
canyons here are the ones where these flows were concentrated, but also further to the east there were debris flows. I heard in Santa Monica Creek, Taro Canyon, and other places, but they certainly weren't the size of these. We'd have heard a lot more about it. They do have pretty big debris basins in some of those, and I'm sure that that helped. So uh, we're concerned where the mountains meet the flatlands, and that's where these flows uh, want to go. So the U.S. Geological Survey made this wonderful prediction. I say wonderful in a, bad, in a different way because I'm not happy about this event at all. But I'm happy they, they are doing this work. And they identified a 60, to, I think a 60, 80 percent probability of a debris flow from all these red channels, provided you had this intensity we're talking about. And their intensity was a little different than the one, but it's essentially uh, the same. And you can see these red zones run all the way down here up into Ojai. This is the back country. It's not such, a, such as near a worry. There are areas along the Pacific Ocean and up into Ojai and so forth that any of these areas could have had this event, had that amount of rainfall fell, that burst of rainfall that fell at Montecito. Uh, this is just a kind of a map of uh, the area again. I got this off the web from, from NASA, I think, or something, but uh, Larry sent it to me, actually. But you see all these little lines up here? Can you all see those? Hundreds and hundreds of little lines. What are those lines? They're little rills and small rills and big rills and bigger rills, and each one of those are small failures. We think the source is, are these things, so many of them. In Rattlesnake Canyon, it was a big landslide. But in, in this case, it seems to be these rills. But we're not sure. We need to go up there. Larry says he's going to climb up there and uh, map these and look at them. And we're going to try to get the conductivity. And uh, Derek Booth was telling me that he went up to part of these things. You get lots of big ones and lots and lots and lots of little ones of these rills from all sizes, each one carrying runoff. And in five minutes, carried enough runoff probably to generate these flows. So uh, you can kind of see where they, I believe, where they came from. Down below in the sandstone units, you don't see it. This, this is, I think, probably the Cozy Dale Shale. And there's other shale units further up, the Hunkow. And we'll be looking at that one. There may be sources there. So the thing that we learned about these flows is, and I learned this from Tom Dunn. I'll be honest. I wasn't an expert on debris flows, even though I've dated and studied them, that the, these events, while being rare, and you need the boulders, you really need the mud. Without the mud, the whole thing won't work. So with, because when the fine stuff comes down, it infiltrates the boulders in the channel, it bulks it up. If you're filling, you can imagine, if you had a room full of bowling balls, you'd have about 33% empty space, right? And just a poor space. Fill that all through the fine stuff and saturated, you bulked it up. You've got a rock with the density of a rock moving down the hill, you know, flowing but moving at 20, 30 miles an hour. And you wonder why we see this massive destruction. There doesn't seem to be any doubt as to why it happens. This is uh, some more pictures I've taken off the wood. San Ysidro Creek got particularly hard hit at Randall Road, above and below Randall Road. That's one area we're looking into a lot. Where the stream, uh, this is before the flow, and all the homes out in here. And after the flow, it looked more like this. There's that same house with the interesting garden and driveway. And, and so many homes were lost there. Downstream, downstream, it looked like this. So um, you see how much wider it is here down below San Ysidro Road. It, it, the width of the flow increases to hundreds of meters. Why did that happen? We don't really know, except the culvert and and where the bridge goes, did block. And so when the flow hit it, it probably rose up like a giant and then spread out down below. And it looks something like this. So this is 192. Here's Randall Road. And a lot of damage was done in this area in terms of loss of, of homes. But the creek normally narrow suddenly widened out, you know, hundreds of meters. We want to know why that happened and can we plan our infrastructure so it doesn't happen again in the future. 
that we can somehow pass these flows. So under the culvert at 192 here, there were two big boulders stuck in there. The whole thing was just plugged. The, it's a pretty big culvert. I mean, you walk through it and stuff. But if you get two big boulders plugging it up, and the flow's coming down 30 miles an hour, did I say 30? Yeah, 20 or 30. Backs up, it's going to go over it. And sometimes it could go over maybe 10 or 15 feet. And when it gets to the other side, it's going to spread out. Okay, so that's one of the things we're looking at. Here's one of the boulders. And this guy is, uh, is, is drilling holes in to split it. I asked him why he was doing this. I didn't ask. I should ask why they're doing this particular boulder because it'll make a kind of scenic boulder for a couple hundred years and it wasn't on the road. You want to get the ones off the road under the culverts. I don't think we're going to see a flow that's going to move this one again, but they're, they're in the mood of destroying boulders up there. And so, uh, and so they're getting a lot of the big ones. And uh, they drill a hole in them and, and, then you just, and then you can split them pretty easy. Well, the people who built Santa Barbara knew this a long time ago. You ever been to Pedragosa Street? Giant, big rock. All the houses under there have boulders of all sizes. And people learned a long time ago, it's pretty easy to split these things. All you have to do is drill a few holes, put some water in it and a wood wedge, and pound on it, and it'll break. You can break these into smaller parts and cart them off. That's kind of what they're doing at San Ysidro here. This is what it looked down, like down below, though. The flow all the way up to the top of the first floor of the houses. I think this may be Paul. But uh, a part of our research, we were looking at this area. There's still a lot of fine material, but a lot of it's left. And we call these open framework boulders. Like I said, you start with a room full of bowling balls, fill it up with fine sediment, and somehow get that fine sediment out again, you're back a room full of bowling balls. And we're interested in where that fine sediment goes. Apparently, it goes downstream and separates. And that's why there's probably so much fine sediment at the far southern end of the flows. We don't know, though, for sure. That's one thing we're doing. Uh, this is just a map. and You've all seen these maps in the papers. But I will call your attention to stream, stream, stream. These things came down the drainages, OK, for the most part. Came right down the drainages. The red dots are the destroyed home. Big cluster, 192, and San Ysidro Creek, a huge amount. Uh, down near the freeway that we know about. 101 was close along because of that. The whole creek, I heard, just moved position. And that brings up something Larry can talk about. But in the lower parts and some parts of these fans, the flow paths are unpredictable. And so they, the sh whole channel can suddenly shift by hundreds of meters sometimes. And because if you think about it, a alluvial fan, well, Larry, I don't want to feel his son. He'll tell you what alluvial fans are. But these came down these channels, and obviously we don't want people living in the path of either floods, whether it be flash floods, regular floods, or debris flows, even though they're rare. We're much more likely to see flash flooding, uh, but, it, but they all kind of go the same place. This is taken from the FEMA map of the floodplains. It has some damage on here, too. But, but again, you see these are pretty well known. The areas in between here are high ground because these faults go through in this area and uplift the land. And so parts of Montecito are relatively safe because they're just too high for any perceivable debris flow to, you know, to get over it. Uh, so uh, there's something to think about. But it's pretty hard to develop anything that's on a house-by-house -house basis. So you just need to evacuate. And usually these things are over quick. Is this going to rain tomorrow really hard? Tomorrow's over pretty quick. It isn't like you're out two weeks waiting for the fire to get there, OK? So uh, which is often the case, because we don't know if it's going to be wind-driven or, or not. And so it, the fire may move a couple miles a day or 50. Not that many, but you know, it can move fast in the right conditions. Otherwise, so people may be evacuating beyond their homes for weeks, because we don't know. Uh, this is in the lower part of Montecito down near um, Casa de Rinda, where I had some friends living for a while. Uh, they were lucky, to be honest with you. It made it through uh, into their property. Uh, but if more of the flow had gone in there, it could have crashed right through that place. And they, so they were lucky. And a lot of people were not very lucky in this part. It, this is where a lot of homes were washed off the foundations. Some of the homes were literally feet from the creek, next to a bridge, where we know the flow rose up. 
And so that's a particularly hazard. But nobody knew this. I mean, they'd had other floods there before, and the floods had passed. What made this so different was the bulking effect of bulking up the volume, moving fast, hitting obstructions, and just over, over into the neighborhoods. This is an alluvial fan, and Larry has some to show you too. But these are these, oops, these different, uh, these different colors here, whether dark or light, are just different flow paths. The lighter ones are the are the younger ones. This is Santa Rosa Mountains in California. Just shows that over time, the thing moves around, and so alluvial fan flooding is a, a, a big problem. And uh, this map is, uh, Larry has a much better one than this, and he'll show you in a few minutes. But all this is alluvial fans in Montecito. The whole place, for the most part, are built on debris flow fans. Uh, read my lips. The whole place. So, so but, but again, they're rare events. So how do you plan for things that happen every few hundred or a thousand years? It makes it really difficult. Anyway, Larry will talk about, about this. And these are the faults going through that uplift the land. So um, what we need then, the optimal conditions for these high magnitude debris flows in the chaparral are basin instability and abundance of boulders, which makes the creeks pretty to climb around in. Uh, but uh, you know those boulders came from somewhere, and they aren't going to be there forever. That's the problem. You need a wild, a wildfires almost always required. If you have below normal antecedent precipitation, read that as a, as a drought, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's useful. High magnitude intense storms, really high magnitude, really intense, then you can get these events. So what have we learned from so far? And we have learned to learn a lot more when Kristen and Larry and the rest of and Tom uh, finish with this project in a year or two. I'll be off on sabbatical in some balmy beach, I hope, at least the next quarter. I planned this before the debris flow came, though. Okay? Need to improve the science of debris flow and fire recurrence. Are high magnitude debris flows after fire rare events? We think so. Climate change, though, is increasing the intensity of wildfires as well as precipitation, precipitation events, so these may become more common. Not super common ever, but more common. We need. We need an education program for the community. This is where my PhD student in geography go to from Brazil. Uh, and she's uh, studying the same kind of thing in Brazil. Uh, one thing we, I've kind of thought of is that when we send these, we have time to send a warning out about the meteorology, maybe a, a 10 or 20 second little video showing what can happen in a debris flow would influence people so they'll evacuate. Only 15% evacuated, but if you saw a debris flow, you'd probably get out pretty quick. But on the other hand, if you hear it coming, it's probably too late. These things sound, people say freight trains, jet planes. Uh, Tom Dunn said he sounds like machine guns going off because these rocks are all grinding against each other and against the base, they make a terrible noise. And that's not the time to go out and investigate what it is, okay? <laughs> because you might run right into it. It's also not the time to get in your car and try to get out. If the flow is already there, you'll just get caught in it, right? So what do you do? You've got to go to high ground, shelter in place. At that point, it's too late uh, to, to actually get out before the flow comes through. But with proper meteorological advance notice, we can make decisions. I mean, we're not asking, people don't have to evacuate for weeks uh, from a rainstorm, right? Uh, so you can... Uh, Although if the debris flow comes down, to clean it up may take that long. But, but at least you won't be there, okay? In a few hours, uh, you know, situation is much different. Probably only lasted a few minutes when it came down. 30 miles an hour. How long does it take to get to the beach? Drive a car 30 miles an hour down the beach in a few minutes, right? So, so we're, we're also, I, Kristen said I should mention this. We're attempting to get funding, and uh, we can't do these things for free. And I'm not asking you for money. We're applying to the NSF and other places to get emergency funds on a quick response, working with the geological survey. They came in and are doing much of the hazard work because they developed a model for this stuff. And we're involved in uh, looking at the long-term history and working with that hazard and what's happening up in the mountains. So th this is the uh, map. 
the USGS produced the whole thing. There was a big donut up here in Ojai. And, but all these red zones had the propensity in this next year to have these debris flows. And so Ojai, parts of Ventura, parts of the coast down here, it's possible we'll see these things happen more if we have a heavy winter rain again. Could happen anywhere where it's red, and maybe even a place that's not red. But their model's pretty good. In some cases, they're 80 to 100% certain. They're luckily most in the back country. But uh, so this sort of map's a godsend to people doing hazard analysis uh, because uh, we're not perfect at predicting weather, but we can see these storms coming. And they told us it was going to, first they said it was going to be small, right? They always start out small a couple weeks in advance. Oh, don't worry, a small little bit of rain. Then about two days before, they said, well, this looks a lot bigger. And, uh, and then, they, then, of course, about the day before, they were really telling people to get out. And uh, people had fatigue, I suspect, from, from being evacuated so long. And nobody heard of debris flows. Nobody knew about alluvial fans. So they'd been through floods before, so uh, only about 15% of the people evacuated. So anyway, this is a easy relative, this slides from the U.S. Geological Survey. Of kind of things you can do, uh, Staying alert's a good one. Pay attention to the news. And if people say you should get out, you should get out. Uh, and you probably get back in in just a few hours if things don't last that long. Know a weather radio on TV. Channel 3 is really good at this. They're all the time have their news people telling us what's going to happen. Uh, so if you have in an area that, it, that has, a, has had debris flows or flash flooding, and this is along the channels for the most part, although they can shift. Uh, and you have to be really careful when driving. Bridges may be washed out, culverts over top. You don't really want to drive out in a flash flood, OK? And, uh, but if you've waited that long and you hear this freight train out front, it's too late. You, you go someplace that you think is safe. You don't try to cross the stream to the other high. You've got to go up your side as high as you can get, because it's coming. It may already be there. But again, this high intense rainfall, the time between that and the debris flow is just minutes. And so there's not a lot of time. Okay. So our objectives over the next year are more than this. This is just some of them. We want to map the source areas and paths of the Montecito debris flows. We want to get an idea of the volume of debris flows. The US Geological Survey is doing some of this as well. Uh, we want to improve the science of fire-related debris flows. And a big one, improve the education. I want everybody in Montecito to know where those big boulders came from and what brings them down and what sorts of conditions. So that if we see something like this in the next winter, it's not impossible to get another debris flow. We don't know how many boulders are up there. I think it's uh, unlikely, but it could happen. We certainly could have mud flows coming off these areas, which can also be destructive. And we can have flash flooding. So it's, you've got to pay attention to Mother Nature, all in a warming world, really. And that's part of the message of, of this whole thing. Oops. I had a couple slides on the science, but we'll do that another time. This is the USGS model. It's a lot of math. Uh, but, but it worked really well. Now, I congratulated these guys. I said, you have a, a really good model. You predicted straight away, you know, what were the areas of the high probability should the rainfall occur? And unfortunately, that rainfall occurred in Montecito. Could have occurred in Ventura. Could have, could have occurred above Ojai. And Carpinteria was on the edge of it. So uh, we need to pay attention to the weather reports. It just means we have to be more vigilant for the next year or two at least until that chaparral starts to come back and kind of heal itself. And then uh, hopefully... Uh, these sorts of events can, uh, can be minimized. At tragic events, our hearts go out to all the people who had their homes lost, the lives that were lost. Uh, this is a big event for our community. We all know that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I'll... Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Larry Garoa. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about alluvial fans. He mapped them out there. He knows where they are. And uh, you want to do that now, Larry? Can you hold this? Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to just basically have a quick discussion on alluvial fans, where they're at, how they develop, 
and why they occur. Um, here's a map of Santa Barbara. Um, point this out. Here's the Mesa, downtown Santa Barbara, uh, Riviera, Montecito area, um, Summerland area. And um, you notice all these orange colors, these kind of orange colored areas here. Those are all alluvial fans, right? And these yellow areas are basically where the streams are and younger alluvium is being deposited. But you can see there's extensive alluvium, uh, alluvial fan deposition occurring and has occurred in Santa Barbara as well. Uh, I'd like to point out the Rocky Nook debris flow that Ed pointed out, that's this area right here. Um, it's average about nine meters thick, right about 28 feet. So it would have done extensive jam uh, damage had it occurred uh, today or these uh, currently. As well, there's another Pleistocene debris flow uh, just north of Sycamore Canyon, uh, one that I worked on that was about 25 feet thick. Right? And if you notice here, right, here's a geologic map of Montecito. All right, just to kind of point out the uh, zoos down here. Uh, this is going to be Montecito Creek, Hot Springs, Oak, this is basically your Montecito area. All these orange colors here are alluvial fans, and you can see the extent. Basically, they extend from the foothills all the way down to the coast. Um, and if you note these red dashed lines, those are the faults, and they'll be a little bit more apparent in the uh, next slides here. And I'll just point out that you notice that here in uh, just north of Summerland, you have a large ridge. Over to the west, we have Mission Ridge. Those are basically large uplifts. Basically, the crust is being, up, uh, being brought up by faults in the area. And so they provide topography. So you're up on top of Mission Ridge, you're up on Arroyo Purita Ridge. The likelihood is, is very low because you have quite a bit of elevation. But if you notice, you've got this large corridor here where the alluvial fans literally extend all the way to the coast. If you've compared the, the previous map of Santa Barbara, you notice we really don't get that extent of alluvial fans all the way to the coast. But if you look at Montecito, those fans extend all the way to the coast. Uh, one thing I want to point out is the uh, kind of the northern part of the alluvial fans. If you notice, they all kind of terminate up here. That's what's called the mountain front. The mountain front is basically an imaginary line between the steep slopes of the mountains and the more gently inclined coastal plain here. Right? So here's our canyons coming out here, and we'll start pointing those out next. All right, so I define that a mount mountain front is basically your break and slope from the steep slopes of the mountain to the uh, gently inclined coastal plain of Montecito. Uh, alluvial fans are basically a grading deposits, basically deposits that get stacked on top of each other, all right? Uh, from basically, these originate from streams that come from drainage basins, and I'll show you what those are next, all right? And in Montecito, what we have, we have multiple canyons, cold water canyon, hot spring canyons, uh, so on and so on. So we have these multiple canyons that are shedding debris, and we have these alluvial fan, fans forming at the mouth of the canyon, basically right at the mountain front. And so what you have, you have these depositional uh, focus points. And what, they, what happens is, over the millennia, they basically just start joining up because, as Ed had mentioned, the, the direction of, in terms of where the material is going just basically jumps around through time. And I'll, I'll talk about that. <clears throat> this is an, uh, uh, what we call a digital elevation uh, model hillshade. You can actually see the topographic highs, the topographic lows. Here's Montecito right here. This is Arroyo Perito Ridge. This is just the east end of Mission Ridge here. And here's Montecito. We have Montecito Creek, Hot Springs Creek, Oak Creek, San Ysidro Creek, Romero Creek, coming up, Piquet Creek. And if you notice, you can see these little bumps on the, uh, the ground surface. And if you notice, they all line up in a linear form. They're basically all along a straight line. Those are the result of faulting. So the faults are actually bringing, making little bumps, a look, basically bringing up the ground surface, creating little hills in Montecito that 
um, in terms of when material comes down, it tends to be deflected. And if you kind of uh, an extreme case of that, if you look at Mission Ridge here, you'll see that Monte Montecito Creek basically deflects around it. it. It won't flow into this. It's going to deflect around the big uplift, the fault uplift. Same thing here for Piquet Creek. Hits this, and it's just going to be it's going to flow around that big fault uplift. And for the, you know, for the most part, you got these little ones here. You, you have enough elevation, you're going to be above any type of flow. However, if you start looking at these areas in between, for example, this area here, down through here, you really don't have any elevation. You don't have any um, fault ridges uh, producing any, um, any hills. This is what Montecito used to look like back in 1928. It's very different from today. Um, you can see the creeks. The creeks are actually defined by a lot of vegetation. Um, all right. The mountain front, basically that break and slope is going to be right up in here. And you can see these kind of nice, smooth surfaces here. That's the alluvial fans. Right? And you notice the absence of houses near the creeks, right? for the most part. There's, you, know, you might see a couple here, but you don't see a lot of resident houses by the creeks. And that's because you won't really want to avoid, you know, living next to a creek in terms of the flood hazard. And then what we're talking about now is the debris flow hazard, right? If you notice the, these kind of shapes here, if you notice this, you get a shape right here, you get a little bit of elevation. These are actually alluvial fans here, right? And prior to when there was any homes here, this was in a natural state, all right, any one canyon, all right, over time, the flow might, might pretty much represent what it is here. But sometimes these debris flows are very sticky and pasty. They don't have a lot of fluid. They won't flow great distances. So what will happen is it will flow, and it loses the confinement of the channel. You can see this nice, deep groove right here. So that, that's a canyon. So it's, it's going to be confined within the canyon. However, once it reaches the mouth of that, it has a tendency to kind of just spread out. And one flow can come in, and it could just basically plug that canyon. And then the next flow will come out. It might come out over here further to the west, all right? And it might stay there for decades, centuries. Then it might plug up, and then it's going to switch back. So these alluvial fans have a tendency for the, the, the source stream to kind of jump around. And that's the result of, you know, varying degrees of flows and your deposits. And sometimes these flows will actually just kind of flow in the creek, plug it up, and then the the creek's going to jump over one side or the other, much like what occurred um, in this, these events where um, numerous uh, uh, occasions people have said, I have a new creek by my property, or the creek, I, there's new channels, um, according to the, the county uh, department. So in terms of the sources, right, here's, here's our mountain front. You can see the nice, lush, kind of green vegetation here. Um, if we follow these canyons back up into what we call the drainage basins, this is basically, this is the crest of the San Ynez right here. You can follow along the fire break. And then we have these different basins that kind of come up. The creeks will come up and they extend all the way up. This is our drainage divide. So any water that flows on this side is going to flow to the north. Any water that flows to the south is going to flow into the Montecito Basin. And if you look, just generally speaking, I just kind of, dash some lines here, you can see a lot of this white little lines here. And that's areas where the soil has actually been removed, rills, um, gullies, and there's been evacuation material. Now this is from, this is a NASA photo from space. And if we can see these um, from thousands of feet up, those, those are likely to be meters, tens of meters wide. So there's a lot of material that got evacuated out. There appears to be a preferential or a higher degree of erosion because we can actually see these, this, basically this white is actually showing you the bedrock underneath. So that's where the soil basically, several feet, several meters of soil have actually been washed out into the canyons and they eventually make its way um, into the alluvial area and then deposits. Alluvial fans are associated with active tectonic areas. All right, that's, that was uh, my focus of my dissertation was earth, earthquake hazards in Santa Barbara. We determined that Santa Barbara is an active fold belt. 
It's, it has a reverse faults and it produces these folds. The folds are expressed as Mission Ridge, uh, uh, Arroyo Parita, or these, or these little hills along the faults. So we are in an active tectonic area. All right. There is a flood potential as well associated with these uh, alluvial fans. Um, because as I said, these, these creeks kind of jump around. Um, the flows are variable. You can have high discharge, short-lived uh, flow events that can flood. And one it, very significant aspect, debris flows are, are part of alluvial fan deposition. It's, it's just the nature of the deposits. Debris flows are an inherent part of alluvial fans, right? Uh, we can form these debris fans, and that's what I pointed out at the mouths of the, the canyons, where it's just coarse, coarse material. In Santa Barbara, Tom Dibley, um, when he was mapping Santa Barbara back in the 40s and published maps in the 80s and 90s, he actually termed the material that we see now on Mission Ridge, um, up at Schofield, um, Rattlesnake uh, Fan, he called us fanglomerates, and that was because it was so coarse, it had so much boulders, cobbles, material, that he just called it fanglomerate. And that's basically the word that we use for deposits of debris flows. Right? So um, these debris flows are just an inherent part of the nature in terms of the deposition of Santa Barbara. All right, you have four main types of de depositional products, but number one, debris flows. You have sheet floods, stream channel deposits and sieve deposit deposits, but most importantly is the debris flows and the flood hazards associated with alluvial fans. All right, um, just kind of a prerequisite for flows are the source, source rocks, and Ed mentioned this. If you ever go to Rocky Nook Park, that's your really, it's an excellent example of, of going to a site and looking what a debris flow looks like. Even though we're telling you it's a thousand years old. In geologic time, that's a pristine debris flow. You can see the boulder fields on top. You can go in the creek and look at these beautiful boulders, as Ed mentioned, 10, 20 feet in diameter. And if you look down at the creek, you're gonna just see them stacked up. You're gonna see a lot of holes in between the rocks. Well, that's where all the material of this mud basically filled in and eventually started kind of creating these, uh, basically created some buoyancy for these boulders to be carried off. So you can actually see what the materials were in, in Coldwater Canyon, Hot Springs Canyon, the same type of materials that were basically coming down and being incorporated and entrained into this debris flow. All right. Um, in, in terms of these uh, steep slopes, and um, we can promote rapid runoff and erosion. All right. We form hydrophobic soils, which basically makes the runoff uh, much, much worse. And as Ed had mentioned, it's basically, it's just going to run off like a sheet of glass as well. And you have greater runoff, you're going to lose your soils basically down to bedrock, and then there's your, there's your fine materials. In the Santa Barbara area, or excuse me, the Montecito area, we have two formations that are shale formations. They, redder, they weather readily, which means they break down to clay really quickly and they provide basically the components of the mud, basically the sand, silt, and clay that helps to buoyant um, the boulders. It's almost like a thick grout, a thick grout slurry that's working its way down the canyon and just uh, creates that buoyancy for these boulders to be carried off. All right. and, we, and as this material is in, in training or incorporating these boulders, it'll pick up vegetation, it'll pick up other debris, um, you can actually form a temporary dam in a canyon, and that's where all the debris, the wood, the boulders can actually kind of create a, a temporary natural dam. And what happens is it allows that flow to build up behind it. It gets breached, and then all of a sudden that material just blow out with much more force, much more momentum, and much more material, making it just a far worse catastrophe. Right. Um, this is actually what we think was the case for the um, Rocky Nook Park, that there was actually a temporary dam, and that's why the, there was so much material associated with it as well. There are high viscosity, uh, very dense flows. Um, these large boulder class float in this kind of fine grain matrix as they kind of just bounce and make their way down into the, uh, down the canyons and into the alluvial plain. So they tend to be flushed out at canyon mouths, and they typically occur as narrow lobes, 
But as we see um, in Montecito, we have areas where they just tend to widen. And that's one of our questions in terms of our research is why, why do they widen? Why do we get these, these narrow lobes or these corridors where the debris flows flow down and then they kind of just open up? So th that's one of our questions that we'll be answering. And you know, as it was as very clear to all of us, I mean, these are very destructive alluvial fans, I mean, excuse me, debris flows. And so our purpose here is to um, let people understand what they live on. And as Ed had mentioned, you have beautiful boulders thrown out in Montecito, but, but they came here from prior debris flows. The, debris, the alluvial fans in Santa Barbara range in age from 125,000 years, 80,000 years, and we believe that here they could be much, much younger. Um, we'll probably be working on that aspect as well. But essentially for the last 125,000 years, debris flow deposition has been occurring in, on the Santa Barbara Plain, including the Montecito alluvial plain. So we really need to keep that in consideration in terms of really understanding where we live. Right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorilla. To start off with, um, there's a couple of very specific ones about specific uh, areas or, or even flows that you brought up, so I want to start with these. These are, these are shorter, more specific. First off, is there any explanation for why the Oak Creek near San Jacinto Road did not have a debris flow where the two creeks on either side had large ones? That particular creek runs by one of my favorite schools, Montecito Union, the Y, and, uh, and, and, and there's a small park there as well. Now the tennis court is tilted because it's on an anticline, but that creek doesn't go very far up in the mountains, and it doesn't go high enough to get in these source areas. I think that's why they really didn't have much of a flow. Okay. What was the estimated volume and extent of the rocky nook flow that you, you spoke of, uh, and how does that uh, event compare with the volume and extent of the one we just experienced? Well, we don't know the volume of the Montecito flows yet. That's something we're uh, working on. And even the extent, really. The US Geological Survey's map there, we'll be looking at it. Uh, Rocky Nook flow was about a million cubic yards, 10 million cubic yards. And the size of the landslides about the same. Went down the canyon where it was confined, came out near Rocky Nook, flowed by the uh, Museum of Natural History and on down. It was stopped by the ridge there, which is uplifted along a fault. Does All that right. help you? I hope. Larry, I'm, Larry's <laughs> fighting the bit. We'll give him some good questions. Right. He's good. He did most of the work. You know, us professors don't really do a whole lot of work. Yeah. We're good at telling, get out there and get that information. I was going to say, his name was on all your stuff. I don't know if you noticed I know. that. Uh, <laughs> so we've got uh, another specific comparison uh, question here. And is, uh, can you make any comparisons between the recent debris flow and what happened uh, in Montecito in 1969. You may know more about that. Well, Mo the, the fl we had floods in 69, 2005, and other times. It did not lead to debris flows. One of the things we're going to do is see what the intensities of those were. We didn't have a fire. It's becoming really clear in Southern California in the Chaparral. You can get a debris flow without a fire, but it's not very likely. The fire plays a big role. And so as a result, the fire and debris flow are linked almost as one event. But the people at USC, they say, call it the one-two punch. Slam dunk. We like basketball. Got it. All right, another one here. Um, this is around recurrence interval. Uh, what is the recurrence interval of debris flows and the size and scale, approximate location of what just happened in Montecito and San Ysidro Creek? Uh, and when was the penultimate flow like this in Montecito? Any evidence for last time? They may be on the order of a couple hundred, a few hundred years uh, recurrence interval to maybe up to a thousand uh, rec years recurrence interval. Um, that's one of the things we, we hope to greater understand from this study. And what was the, the second? And the second was, uh, when was the penultimate flow like this in the Montecito area? That's an unknown. That's, that's an unknown at this point. Um, we, we know that there were. You mean were. you weren't there? <laughs> <laughs> no, but in terms of that, that's, that's the part, that's basically a characteristic of these fans. It did occur. Yeah. If we were to guess, which I don't do, yeah. uh, the younger fans, the youngest fans may be similar 
to some of the ages near Rocky Nook, but we don't know. One of our objectives is to go in there and date as many of these fans as we can. They tend to be younger near the coast. Absolutely, yeah. They're gonna be what we call Holocene in age, so with light for likely within the last 11,000 years and up to maybe the last thousand years. Okay. Um, so as you're looking for evidence, this is, a, this is a little bit about the particular evidence of past flows uh, in the region. Can, is there evidence available, can you identify it, if at all, of, of fires before past flows? Like, do you see charcoal evidence of burnt material in those flows as you're looking at the, the older flows? Well, we studied Slide Creek. We named it that up uh, off the Matillaha Creek with Joan Florsham. And uh, I was going to originally study these streams here by putting stream gauges in, you know, and doing the typical hydrology thing. And I met a friend of mine, Vic Baker, who studies extreme events at Tucson when I was giving a talk, says, you know, when you see your event, you're going to lose everything. And the USGS said the same thing. They lost their instruments uh, that they had in the stream. In many cases, they, we found our gauge played out on the beach. So then we made a decision to map the deposits and date them. And in Slide Creek, I think we dated three, two or three debris flows separated by several hundred years with charcoal. And, a, and the charcoal comes down with the debris because it carries a lot of woody debris and so forth. So we can date it. We also have other dating methods, optically stimulated thermoluminescence. That's a mouthful. Uh, but it's similar to exposure dating in some respects based on radioactive properties, though, in the soil. Uh, was the Rincon Shale a factor in some of the slippage or slides that have occurred? No, the Rincon Shale is not in the drainage basin. However, there are other two other shale formations associated with it. Rincon Shale is notorious for landslides, uh, but in this case, it was the Hunkel and Cozy Dell, and it does have that same inherent nature of breaking down rap rapidly into to fine materials and to clay materials, mm -hmm. and so that's that's a likely source for our, for our finds. Yeah. yeah, the fine materials is the key to the whole thing, Tom Dunn tells me. And I think he's right, because without the fine material, and it's not very much clay, maybe one or two percent, it's really the silts and fine sands that lead to the, bulk, the bulking up. Without that, uh, you probably couldn't move those boulders. They're going to stay there. I mean, our big flood in our basins, I've measured things one meter moving a little bit, but there's nowhere near two, three, four, 10, 20 meter things moving by our normal floods. So just because we have more things we need to worry about, uh, can you <laughs> speak to the risk of sinkholes as a result of uh, fans and slides like this? Well, I ref I, Larry can talk about this too, but I, I think of sinkholes as being in limestone. You know, the Mitchell Plain in Indiana, Carlsbad Caverns. In California, we talk about sinkholes as holes in roads sometimes, where a pipe bursts and it collapses in. They say, oh, there was a sinkhole. Uh, and you can call them that if you want. But uh, I didn't see any sinkholes in these flows, and so maybe Larry did. No, no, they, it's typically in limestone. Mm -hmm. You'll see it in the news, a sinkhole associated as Ed said, a storm pipe, uh, maybe a cesspool that was buried and, and wasn't uh, filled up properly. You, you can get localized sinkholes from that, but, but no. And these are big, yeah. big hazards in yeah. Florida. I mean, whole area as large as this building can fall down 40 feet instantaneously. We don't have limestone, so forget about the sinkholes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody feel better about that? Yeah. <laughs> but they don't have debris flow. Okay, go ahead. All right. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Two-part question, uh, ha have any of the local muni let me try that again, municipalities and or law enforcement agencies reached out to you uh, regarding the determination of evacuation zones uh, for events such as this? And if not, what kinds of recommendations would you make? Well, we hesitate to make any recommendations at this point along uh, those things. I'm working with flood control and other people. They did ask people to evacuate. Some were mandatory, some were required. Uh, we need to look in that at the appropriate time. I don't think now is the appropriate time till we better understand these flows and events. But I will tell you, if we get another meteorological warning like that and you live along the banks of these creeks, I would heed the warning. They, they didn't use our geologic maps. No. Uh, the Department of uh, the State California yeah. Geological Survey did use our maps did for assessment. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, and there's a few questions about the maps, actually, so let me try to, to get those. And I don't know if we want to try to get the slide back up. Um, but 
the first part is, have the origin sites of the slides been assessed? You, you, you're, you've told us you're working on that. Uh, and is there a high risk for additional slides likely in the same areas? Well, again, these aren't slides, they're flows. It's really important to get a, and Tom Dunn told me this too, I keep talking about him, but he's a very famous guy in debris flows. We're, we're not talking about mud slides. In a slide, the things that are together stay together. In a flow, they move apart and around. These are flows, and part of our trouble is not necessarily understanding that part of it. What can happen in the rest of the year and next year? If we get big rains, we could see mud flows. If there's enough boulders in some of these creeks, we might see more debris flows. I suspect a good portion of them came out. And from what we've seen in the lower parts of Cold Springs, there's not much left. However, however flash floods are still a real possibility. Yeah, there, there may be an occasional landslide that actually failed, uh, more so in terms of the shallow material, just basically the soils. Um, if you look up, you, you can see the narrow rills when you look up towards the, mountain, the mountains, but you do see some areas that are actually quite larger, and you, you, what comes to mind to me is that failed as, as a slide. Um, but in terms of the, the slopes themselves, they're, they're failing by, mainly by flows. Yeah, you do get slides in the mountains, okay? Yeah. And the slides are these shallow things to very big ones, but when they mobilize, then they flow, and that's when we're in the realm of debris flow. Uh, there are a number of questions here about the maps that you, with the, okay. uh, the risk maps. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pile a few of these yeah. on and we can talk a little bit, maybe help explain for those that, that uh, had some questions. Uh, so when they're showing the colors, the orange, red, yellow, are those probabilities? Uh, are, if you're outside of those, are you yeah. safe? Uh, what do the various colors represent uh, for the mm -hmm. entire area, et cetera? So there's, there's some folks yeah, looking for I detail. hesitated to get into that uh, too much. Uh, and they started out being formed by a fire person who was, had a GPS, I guess, on his phone. He started marking the position of damaged homes, people who were evacuated, and, and other situations. So the red, the blue, the black, this, we relate to those things. And you can find those in a lot of the past uh, paper things. The only reason I was trying to show there is that they line up along these drainages. Uh, and so, the, the, but there were several kind of hot spots for damage. You guys all know those. San Ysidro Creek, Lower Montecito Creek, and a, mm -hmm. a few other places. They were also referring to those to the colored maps of the, the likelihood of, oh. a, of an actual debris okay. flow that were yeah, being shared. Yeah, those were in, like, in terms of uh, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, likelihood. Read that probability. Okay, so if you're in an area that says it's 60 to 80 percent, you're going to get a debris flow. If you get an intense burst of rain, that's a pretty high probability. Then you have only, you know, you have only maybe 10 marbles in there and, and six to eight of them could cause that thing. Then you've got a problem. But, you, but to get to that point, you've got to go through the one to 200. <laughs> but, uh, but once they issue those sorts of warnings, if we see the meteorological events developing and someone says you should probably move, you should. All right. Uh, a couple of questions here on the trail systems. Uh, in terms of alter, uh, permanent alteration of our trail systems, uh, was, well, th they used the word, was this impactful? Um, I know some people were here for, for Ray Ford's discussion. Uh, and then the second piece of this was how permanently damaged might the soil biology be? Boy, those are beyond our expertise. Uh, we're not ecologists. Uh, there are ecologists in the room. The vegetation's gone up there, right? It's burned. It'll regenerate in two to five years. In 20 or 30 years, it could burn again. So, but you have to realize this, this ecosystem we call the chaparral has adapted to fire. It, it needs fire, really, to, to, uh, to survive. And it's been around a few thousand years. If you go back six, 8,000 years, it was probably uh, some sort of pine trees and things. It changes on and off. We know from the channel when it changed to chaparral, we start seeing charcoal in the sediments in the channel every 50 to 60, 40 to 60 years. So we know the fire frequency. We have a question here around the, uh, the debris uh, catch basins that you, you mentioned, uh, and some folks are here familiar with them uh, according to their questions pretty intimately. Uh, do a couple of pieces here. Do they, uh, is it possible to create larger debris catch basins that would actually also serve to replenish groundwater is one. Let, let me throw that one out. Um, probably not much. 
I mean, stream water does infiltrate into the stream bed, into these places. Making it much bigger depends on how much land is available. And then where you are, you may have, a, they're often limited by the topography. And I'm not going to talk about how good or how bad these things are because flood control is working that. We're all working on it. And, uh, and that'll come down the road. There are, people have other ways of trying to control these things. They have big wire fences made of rings that are very thick that you put up channels and they, they can catch debris too. They do that in Switzerland. And uh, this poss there's other things we can talk about, but first we've got to know the nature of the beast we're facing before we make those sorts of recommendations. And I said we weren't going to bridge too far into policy tonight, but these are all on that okay. sort of policy track. Okay. So I'm going to give you one more. Oh, okay. um, and this is a, the longstanding conversation around uh, what is the healthiest way to, if you're going to, if humans are going to manage creek channels. Um, we've seen everything from, the, of course, the LA River completely concreted mm -hmm. in uh, to the restoration, uh, more modern day of understanding that, that yeah. uh, a diversity of, of actually topography yeah. and species and such uh, are good for multiple reasons. Could you outline any scientific, compelling scientific arguments for and against those, those okay. ideas and, uh, and the impacts with respect to something like a debris flow? Well, I grew up on one of those things in Glendale, and it's about twi three times as wide as this room and concrete on all sides. I actually met a guy when I was fishing growing up said, I concreted the LA River, and he was proud of it. And that stopped the steelhead and lots of things. But, but I don't know how much that will change the, the alluvial fan flooding and Montrose in that area. It does channel the water down below. And I, I sort of, I'm, I hesitate to even talk about this because I'll get quoted and misquoted. And, but, but, you know, because these, these channels move around, just because you make a big box right at the edge of the fan doesn't mean that it won't just go someplace else. So what you mean, you're gonna, you can't, uh, I mean, we got Santa Monica Creek. That's probably our closest creek that's kind of channelized and has a big debris basin. Um, how much do you want to put into sacrificing things for something that happens every 200 to 1,000 years? And we do it for earthquakes. We retrofit buildings, so maybe. But I'm not going to talk about that. Please don't quote me on that. <laughs> All right. Some of my friends are scared. They say, you're really going to go talk to a bunch of people because you know, you're going to be misquoted, misunderstood. That's right. and, but, but that's okay. I'm, I'm kind of used to that. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. It's not, we're not letting up here for a minute. So All right. I'm going to. Um, actually, there's a, there's a whole series of questions. Let me, let me frame these together into a single question. Um, a lot of folks asking about their own homes, oh. schools. Um, what are the best tools, resources, uh, maybe uh, you know, public institutions, authorities, that people can use to determine the relative danger of their own home, schools, okay. infrastructure? Larry can do that. He's doing some of that now. Yeah. Well, the first thing I look at is find out, uh, determine your elevation of your house. In other words, where your house is located, uh, Santa Barbara County Flood Control has maps you can download online. If you just Google Santa Barbara County Flood Control Topo, it'll send you right to the link. You can find your street, find your house. The next thing I would do would be go to, go to a FEMA map. Those are going to have the 100-year uh, flood, uh, flood zones. And that's your kind of your quickest, uh, easiest way to find out where you're at related to a flood zone. And the flood zones, we, we haven't tested the hypothesis in terms of did the, did the flows um, correlate with the flood zones? It just kind of, kind of, just on comparing, it looks like there may be, um, but that's kind of your quickest way to, to understand what's your hazard in terms of uh, floods and possibly flows, debris flows. Yeah, yeah. One thing I worry about is if we have a flash flood or a mud flow, even without the boulders, and it fills up the channel after they've cleaned it out, where's the water going to go? And so we would be looking at more overbank flooding. So flash flooding is still an, uh, a possibility. Mud flows, I believe, are probably a possibility in the next year or two. You just, but you can't go around worrying about that every day. You know, you make your whole life about these things. But pay attention to the weather when we get in these big systems through. And they're going to be even more conscious of it than you are. And they'll be talking about uh, what's going on. If you really want to evaluate specific houses and areas, there are consulting uh, hydrologists, geologists that can, can help you with that and make recommendations. But if you're sitting right next to a creek, that's a problem. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, couple folks observed- Big observe creek, not the tiny ones, okay. Couple folks observed the, uh, the photos that we've all seen around uh, Highway 101 and the, the closure area, which, and I'll quote here, appeared to serve as, as a debris basin. 
um, <laughs> saving the homes on the south side and protecting them. Would you agree with that assessment? Did that, uh, did that in fact happen I think that it way? broke the, the rails of the freeway, so it went through there. Yeah, we have something we're working on. We don't really know that, but we think maybe the channel changed position there, and that resulted in the ponding in the, in the low. But we don't know. I can't answer that yet. We haven't done, uh, done enough of the research. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> Based on our current knowledge of debris flows uh, and the alluvial fans, uh, where is it safe to build <laughs> in Montecito? Well, well, people ask me this all along. We live in a fire area, and there's, it's pretty hard to find a place in Santa Barbara away from an earthquake fault. It's almost impossible. Uh, a friend of mine tried three times and, uh, and still on a fault. Uh, and and uh, we live very near faults. We feel earthquakes, small ones, all the time. I'm working on a project that is looking at the probability of bigger earthquakes. But, um, but you know, there's a price to pay for topography. If you like flat topography, Kansas is a good option. But they have, <laughs> they have tornadoes and things like that. You can't, you know, this is, I read the paper, it's one of the biggest years of all for natural hazards, billions of dollars of damage, most with the hurricanes. The only advantage to a hurricane, you can see it coming, you know, way out in the ocean. It looks like a big thing the size of the Gulf of Mexico. We were down in Florida one time, and one of these was coming. I said to my wife, Valerie, I said, we should stay here. I've never experienced a hurricane, and we were kind of inland, you know. I didn't think any was a problem, so I went out to the store and bought water and stuff. I went back, and they'd gone to the airport. And so, so, so uh, I flew home anyway. But you don't want to be in the path of a, of a, of a hurricane, that's for sure. But they, they cause massive, massive damage from coastal flooding and so forth. You know, when we get a pretty big earthquake in California, 50, 60 people might be killed, but the same earthquake in the Middle East might kill 60,000. But that doesn't get around it if it's you. So, so we need to pay attention to our story. But no, to answer your question, I don't know of any real safe place, absolutely, uh, almost anywhere. But, but you need to know what you're facing and what the odds are. And, and look, you just have to have a little more. We need to educate people better. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the earthquake uh, risk, we all know we're in an earthquake zone. Are, the, are building upon these alluvial fan bases, this, this material, is, does that have an effect on, on what an earthquake's effect on a structure on top of that might be? Yeah, it can be the earthquake shaking. Uh, if we get these big basins, uh, much like Montecito, filled with alluvium, that alluvium can act like jello, can actually strengthen this earthquake shaking. Uh, LA Basin is notorious for that. And you, you, if your basin is kind of shaped like a big bowl, what happens is the, as the earthquake waves pa enter that bowl of, of alluvium, it basically just bounces around and that alluvium just starts uh, to shake even uh, greater. So there, there is a, an inherent shaking hazard associated with these, these alluvial basins, yeah. It's most intense in places like uh, the old El Estero downtown, mm -hmm. uh, where you have a lot of water-saturated stuff right near the surface. These big boulders will do that, but not near as bad as that. Yeah. If you want to look at earthquakes, you're better off on bedrock. Yeah. <laughs> it may shake, but, but it won't sink into the ground. Uh, so this one, there's a couple here on fires, uh, and, and you spoke about fire frequency, and you showed your graph of where those might line up with rain events and, and others. Um, would, one question, would, actually, would more frequent fires actually reduce risk in any way, as opposed to less frequent but larger or more intense fires? Well, fire frequency is, they are becoming more frequent. And there's a lot of land out there to burn. <laughs> So I, and I don't look favorably upon more fires uh, because fires have taken a thousand homes, you know, in the last decade or so, close to that. So we haven't looked at that. That's one of the things you do in, in hazard analysis. We're not strictly speaking doing that hazard analysis. The U.S. Geological Survey and others will probably have more to say about that. But uh, wildfires scare me. And Especially wind-driven yeah. ones. And if you think about the, the, the more wildfires, you, the greater the probability of the coincidence of intense yeah. rainstorms. So that's, right. you increase your probability. Uh, and someone wanted just clarification, actually, on what you just, okay. just said, Larry, which is uh, the, the frequency of rain is, you were talking about the, 
the chances of the, the coincidence of those two events, not the fact that one is a causal effect for the other, fires right. and, and right. intense rainstorms. Right. Yeah. Well, they don't cause each other, but no. if they line up together, it's like uh, you know, all the stars lining in a direction and things may happen. Uh, like when they line up and you get the sun, the moon, and the earth, you get big tides. But in this case, if you, if you, uh, if you happen to have uh, uh, wildfire, intense precipitation, and a lot of debris around, then the chances of a debris flow are much, much higher. And I think this is one you, you spoke to uh, during your talk, but the, the question is how did so much mud and, and such large boulders actually get transported on the Olive Mill Bridge across Highway 101? The debris flow flowed across the Olive Mill Bridge, then all the way to the Channel Drive and the beach in front of the Biltmore. Please explain, <laughs> exclamation point. Well, I don't know how many big boulders got there. We haven't analyzed that. A lot of mud did. I, we're worrying about, you know, when these debris flows kind of slow down, where it gets flatter, that mud leads, you know, the flow, but it can still carry boulders if they're there. So uh, again, because the densities are, are similar, so uh, these things are notorious for carrying these big boulders. It's not the only way, by the way, you can get big boulders in the landscape. Go to Schofield Park sometime, and you'll see all scattered throughout Schofield Park are boulders 10, 15, 20 feet high. And those on the surface of the landslide there were not brought by debris flow, they rolled down the hill. That's another hazard from up above Rattlesnake Creek. The hikers and, and people who climb these things have names for all of them, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Death Rock, or, or Watch Where You're Going Rock, or they have names for them, you can look them up. But they sent their little mats out there and they climbed these, but those came down, rolling down from the old landslide. But most of the big boulders we see in, in the valley bottoms and stuff are, are from these flows. And like I said, almost all of Santa Barbara are built on these same deposits. I, I'll just point out too, and the rattlesnake fan, that's, that's where the Ed, Ed was saying the boulders come from. They're much, much higher than Schofield Park. So that's an elevated fan. That's much, much higher, and that's a result of this uplift. So that fan is no longer being deposited that's on. Right. It's an isolated, uplifted, elevated fan. Can you imagine an old alluvial fan, hundreds of feet above Rattlesnake Creek, coming down and going over and being folded over the Riviera and then out on the coastal plain? That's what happened in the last 125,000 years. All right. All right, we've got a couple more small specific questions, and then there's one set of questions I'll, I'll end on. Um, we talked about so, some folks asking again about particular risk areas, and, and we mm -hmm. can point them to the, the best maps and information that you've shared. Um, but there's one here regarding uh, the aftermath of the Painted Cave Fire. So this Painted Cave Fire burned in the hills above the Las Positas area. Still today, uh, the vegetation has not regenerated any significant large plants, uh, mostly grasslands, et cetera. Yeah. Um, same along 101 fire from two years ago. How long before plants truly return to these areas, slash do they ever in some cases, um, and what happens after a second or a third fire in, the, in a similar area? Well, I did study the Painted Cave fire, and up in the Chaparral, I think it has recovered. You'll see Chaparral plants. Mm -hmm. Along the Monterey Shale, along the coast, it's grasslands. It's yeah. probably been grasslands for almost forever. And, a, and a, on these coastal uplifted marine terraces, it tends not to be covered in chaparral. So the vegetation reflects the geology and uplift in history, uh, more probably than the fire history in this case. But I believe if you went up to Trout Club and those places around there, there's plenty of chaparral has come back. It, it, that's what it does. You know, it's fire adaptive. It has, doesn't got a lot of choice. It's, the roots don't burn. And so when, when the above ground vegetation goes, they start sprouting. So one more specific question, then we'll end on a, a larger set. And uh, this is uh, regarding Eastern Sierra. <laughs> Someone who's familiar with Eastern Sierra debris flows and asking, are they similar? Uh, are they like the ones we have here? No. And I can say that because Tom Dunn told me he studied those extensively. Uh, those fans are usually caused by snow melt, those debris flows. There's more than one way to get a debris flow. I'm just saying in the Chaparral, this special environment, uh, fires is really important. Up there, it's snow melt this year. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the last larger set of questions, a number of folks asked about, uh, so we talked about climate change and what effects it might have on this. Can you spend a, a couple minutes just talking about what you, what we know, what we anticipate, what the big questions are regarding the interactions between climate change and debris flows and all the factors that, that go into creating them as, as far as we know now? Well, I'm not an expert on climate change. We have people in our department that are. And I believe them when you read the reports and so forth that the climate is indeed changing. Sea levels are rising, which will lead to more coastal erosion. Oceans are warming, which is 
harming our, our uh, coral reefs in places. Uh, more, if you warm the ocean, as I understand it, more energy will go into it, so it's warmer, and that can lead to more intense storms. Uh, we don't know, you know, most of California's rain comes from atmospheric rivers. They call the Pineapple Express out that way. We don't know if they're, how much they're going to increase or if they will increase. Will the El Nino events increase? This is not, I'm out of, out of my lane there. But, uh, but I suspect that climate change does have an effect and it's something that, that other people will be looking into and have looked into. But if you get more fires, longer fire season, more intense rain, more rain, and not necessarily more rain, but more intense, then this sort of thing may become somewhat more common. Well, I, I want to offer a big hand and thank uh, Dr. Ed Keller, Dr. Larry Garola. Thank you so much, Ed. And, and thank you to Citizens Planning Association and Urban Creeks Council and the Santa Barbara Public Library, and thank you all for being here tonight.